Okay, so chapter six is about population and community ecology, and so we'll talk about characteristics of populations, and then chapter seven will be about human populations. So this picture that starts the chapter is a shot of a New England farm that had become a forest, and they knew it was a farm because of those stones you see right there, which is basically the only evidence that there was a farm there. Um, but between 1850 and 1950, uh, people had moved away from the farms to go into the city. And so, meaning they had cut down all the trees during the 1800s, and about 80% of all the forests had been cleared for farmland. So about a year after they moved away, the people, uh, grasses and wildflowers were starting to grow, um, plant species were being rather diverse and then some trees or plants called the goldenrods eventually uh, dominated the fields because they could outcompete other species um, but then the goldenrods ended up getting attacked basically by a beetle so reduced the population of the goldenrods and since the goldenrods was reduced then other plants could compete and actually prosper but then eventually the goldenrods came back and then they declined again and so the populations had fluctuated over time and it just shows that populations can increase or decrease dramatically over time and how species interactions within a community can alter species numbers as well and then finally it shows that since the humans cut down the trees in the forest uh, that human activity alters diversity of species within ecosystems. The environment around us exists at a series of increasingly complex levels. The simplest level is going to be the individual, which is a single organism, and natural selection is going to operate at this level because it's the individual that must go on to survive and reproduce. A population is the next level of complexity, and that is composed of all the individuals that belong to the same species. Evolution occurs at the level of population. Next you have community, which incorporates all the populations interacting together. Next you have uh, ecosystems, and this consists of all the biotic and abiotic components in a particular location. So ecologists will study the flow of energy and matter, they'll look at the cycling of nutrients like we looked at in chapter 3. And then the largest, <clears throat> excuse me, and most complex is the biosphere which incorporates all of the Earth's ecosystems. And so scientists who study the biosphere are interested in the movement of water, the movement of air and heat around the globe. So it's just important to know how uh, nature gets uh, more complex as you move up. So the factors that cause populations to increase or decrease is called population ecology. And when you're calculating uh, the change in population, you're, look at the, you're looking at the inputs, which is births and immigration, outputs, which is death and immigration. So if input is going to exceed the outputs, if there are more births and immigration then deaths and immigration your population will grow and if there's more deaths and immigration uh, that exceed births then the population will decline. So there are numerous circumstances where scientists would want to know the factors that are going to influence population size. Um, an example would be if you have any kind of endangered species you want to know uh, the factors that affect its size so that you can implement measures to improve its survival and reproduction. Also it could be uh, useful to know the population size or the factors that influence it of a pest species. That way uh, then you can start to learn to discover and uh, develop strategies to eradicate that uh, pest. So to know how population is going to change over time you first need to know some basic population characteristics. In those, and that will be population size, density, distribution, sex ratio, and age structure. So population size is denoted as capital N, and that's the total number of individuals in a defined area at a given time. And so it's um, 
kind of up to the agency that's managing the population of what they're studying that's going to define that area. The density is how many individuals are in a per unit area at a given time or uh, volume if it's an aquatic ecosystem that they're studying and this can help to see if a species is rather rare or abundant. So in some areas you could have the density maybe of one organism in a square mile but then in other areas in the state or county or wherever you're studying there could be 20 per square mile. So then it would be helpful for scientists to determine if that population in a particular location, um, if it's too dense, then it might um, use too much food, or if it's not dense enough, maybe they could go extinct in that area. Population distribution is how individuals are distributed with respect to one another. So here are the three types random distribution like in A has these trees with no order to the reason that they're they're just randomly distributed. In B which is uniform uh, distribution that could be some plants like in a plantation um, or it could be this example of birds territorial birds um, that they try to maintain this distance from one another more often you'll see them in clumps well maybe not more often but a lot of times uh, you'll see organisms in clumps like schools of fish or um, herding animals or birds that flock so they live in large groups which enhances their feeding opportunities or gives them protection from predators the sex ratio is simply the ratio of males to females and since the number of offspring that is produced is really dependent uh, of how many females there are in the population, knowing this ratio is going to help scientists um, estimate how many offspring a population will produce in the next generation. And lastly, you have population age structure, and that's how many individuals will fit into particular age categories such as this. This is a population pyramid for a developing country and we will get into this much much more in human uh, pop, excuse me population studies but just know that this is one of the characteristics to know about populations in general. So there are several factors that are going to influence um, population size and the first one are density dependent factors. So the size of a population will influence an individual's probability of survival. So food, water, nutrients for plants, a nesting area slash habitat, those are all dependent on the size of the population. So basically limiting resources are density dependent factors. Limiting resources like we'd studied before with the nutrients in plants in chapter 3 a limiting resource or a limiting factor is one that a population cannot live without. Um, if this limiting resource decreases, then so does the size of the population. So again, food, water, nutrients would all be limiting resources. With density independent factors, it does not matter what the size of the population is uh, for that individual's probability of survival. So basically any kind of natural disaster is going to come through and hit whether or not that was a large population or a small population. And we do uh, do a lab that uh, models density dependent and density independent factors. So population growth models are mathematical equations that are used to predict population size at a certain moment in time. The growth rate is the number of offspring an individual can produce in a given time period uh, minus the deaths of the individual or offspring during that same period. So under ideal conditions with unlimited resources available, every population has a particular maximum potential for growth. And this is little r, or the intrinsic growth rate. So when there's plenty of food available, uh, populations can 
grow um, not uncontrollably but they can grow to their highest potential. So a high number of births and a low number of deaths will produce a high population growth rate. When you have less than ideal conditions when resources are limited as they usually are the population's growth rate will be lower than its intrinsic growth rate or little r because the individuals are going to start having fewer offspring or not breed together excuse me or not breed at all and uh, number of deaths will increase so here is the formula for the exponential growth model and we will do some practice with these numbers and this will be one of the few times that you will use a calculator uh, since you have to use the base of natural log or the e to the x key. So what this equation tells us is that under ideal conditions the future size of the population which is n sub t depends on the current size n sub 0 the intrinsic, intrinsic rate of growth R and the amount of time. So when populations are not limited by resources rapid growth is occurring because more births are going to occur with each step in time. So exponential growth is going to have a J-shaped curve and you could think of it like interest in a bank. So let's say you start with a thousand dollars in your bank account with an interest rate of five percent. So after a year and assuming you didn't take any out, after a year you would have gotten $50 in interest, so you have 1050 Then the next year you gain 5% interest on the 1050 which turns out to be another $52, and so on and so forth. Exponential growth is going to be density independent because uh, the value is going to start growing every year. Um, the exponential growth model is a really good starting point for um, understanding population growth because it shows that real populations, even little ones, will grow exponentially at least in the beginning, but no population can experience exponential growth indefinitely um, because they will, they will reach what is called the carrying capacity because there is a limited resource. There's limited water or there's limited food or there's limited space. Uh, so if you read the experiment on page 150 sorry where'd it go? 153 of the paramecium experiment that Georgie Gauss did uh, he was really exemplifying population growth and how it is limited um, by resources. The exponential uh, growth model describes a continuous increasing population but we know that again that they don't experience exponential growth indefinitely. So they, they modified that model to the logistic growth model and that shows that a, a population whose growth is initially exponential but slows down as it reaches the carrying capacity which is denoted capital K. Um, population will slow down because there was a limit to how many individuals the food supply or water could sustain and that limit is the carrying capacity. Um, knowing the carrying capacity for a species and what that limiting resource is, be it a nutrient or food or water, uh, will help predict how many individuals one particular environment can sustain. So you'll notice that the shape is an S-curve and it is density dependent. Um, it's density dependent because uh, the increased competition for food or water or habitats um, as the population growth occurs and since um, density independent factors like natural disasters or floods or fires are not are, I mean are are unpredictable the logistic model or this growth the s-shaped curve does not account for density independent factors 
Okay, so one of the assumptions of this logistic growth model is that the the number of the offspring that an individual produces depends on the current population size and the carrying capacity. But sometimes, um, like if they mate in the fall and then they have the offspring in the spring, um, there is a risk that food availability will not match the new population size once the offspring is born. So if there's less food in the spring than is needed to feed the offspring, that population is going to overshoot by becoming larger than the carrying capacity of that environment. So if they overshoot and have too many individuals, then there's not going to be enough food and the population will experience a die-off or a population crash. And sometimes that will happen every year that you will have, it doesn't have to be over every year, but it could be every year or every other season uh, where you have overshoots and die-offs and it always, uh, or it will begin to hover around the carrying capacity. Okay, so reproductive strategies. There are, or population sizes is going to increase through reproduction obviously. And so population ecologists saw that there were some reproductive strategies in nature and they belong to either K-selected species or R-selected species. And a K-selected species um, are typically large animals that reach reproductive maturity relatively late, only produce a few large offspring, and provide parental care. This is the kind of population that grows slowly until it reaches the carrying capacity and then it will hover around the carrying capacity. Sometimes it will overshoot and then have die-offs, but otherwise it will hang around the carrying capacity. So the abundance of these species is determined by the carrying capacity, hence they are called K-selected species. Our selected species are on the other side of the spectrum, and these are basically the opposite of K-selected species. <clears throat> they, um, they do not typically remain near their carrying capacity, but they have rapid population growth, and then they have um, big overshoots and die-offs. They are small organisms. They reach reproductive maturity early. They reproduce frequently and they have lots of uh, small offspring and they don't give any parental care. So mosquitoes, cockroaches, dandelions um, are examples of our selected species. And they're, they're called R selected because uh, they have a high intrinsic growth rate and reproduce often and large numbers of offspring. So. Um, intrinsic growth rate is, is denoted little r. So this shows you how opposite they are. And notice that these represent the ends of the spectrum and then there are lots of species that have um, that are in between spectrums and even have qualities or characteristics of both K-selected and R-selected species. This is something you do need to know the difference between, uh, so make sure you know this chart. Next is survivorship curves, and this is something you will do a lab on as well. The first type, or type 1, is a late loss, which late loss, constant loss and early loss are not mentioned in your textbook, so make sure that you do know both terms. Um, because both terms have shown up on the AP exam. So generally your K-selected species like rhinos or elephants or humans typically have high survival rates and die in older age. So they have, um, a, they have a late loss. So when they get to old age then they start dying off in larger numbers. Uh, a type 2 survivorship curve, meaning they have a constant decline throughout their lifespan. And that could just be, you know, through hunting um, or accidents. So some classes of fish, species of fish, some squirrels, corals will uh, have constant decline. 
And then type 3 is early loss, which are mostly the R selected species, so they don't usually reach adulthood and they have um, a high amount of deaths early in life. So you can see here that type 1, they live to an older age and then die. Type 2, constant loss. And then type 3, um, they drop off in numbers pretty early in life. And so very few reach old age. Metapopulations are those um, that get uh, separated generally by um, space. So in this case, in the textbook, they mentioned cougars that moved from um, farmland or forests into mountains to get away from people so they wouldn't be uh, poached. And so they ended up having these little uh, distinct populations within the different mountain ranges and occasionally a few individuals would go uh, to another population. Why this is good is because it could add genetic diversity if they mate um, because generally those small populations are likely to have little genetic variety and so if there was changing environmental conditions, small populations generally do not adapt. So if you can add some more genetic diversity in there, um, that could help reduce the risk of extinctions. One of the factors for determining a species distribution uh, is the interactions with other species, and that's what we're going to touch on next. And there are four categories. There's competition, predation, mutualism, and commensalism. And so the study of those interactions is called community ecology. So the first one is called competition. And this is when uh, the, this is the struggle of individuals to obtain a limiting resource. On the first, uh, on page I think 156, when I said read the story about the paramecium experiment, um, Georgie Gauss noticed that the populations of the paramecium would explode and then it would slow down and then it would basically stop and then individuals would die and what he was observing was them reaching their carrying capacity and that's what this is right here uh oh sorry um, that is what this first graph these first two graphs are showing you that there is exponential growth and then it starts to slow down and then it eventually reaches its carrying capacity so the population growth essentially stops. So he had done a second experiment where he put two different species of paramecium growing in separate test tubes and got these first two graphs A and B and then he put the two paramecium together same amount of food otherwise and noticed that the aurorlia or Aurelia, however you say it, um, started to take off and the numbers for caudatum had dropped. And this was support for the competitive exclusion principle which says that two species that are going to compete for the exact same limiting resources cannot exist, cannot coexist. One is going to end up uh, performing better and the other one is going to be driven into extinction. And so because of this comp uh, competitive exclusion principle, it leads to resource partitioning, which is actually very common in nature, so that they can avoid extinction. When two species overlap in their use of a limiting resource, so in this case in the top picture you see the green, okay, which is where both species um, will eat the medium-sized seeds, Selection is going to favor those individuals of each species um, whose use of the resource overlaps the least. So over many generations, the two species eventually can evolve to reduce their overlap and partition their use of the resource. So they divide it up based on differences in behavior and morphology. So the three ways of resource partitioning is temporal, 
which is when two species use the same resource but at different times. And that could even be two animals hunting. One will hunt during the day, one will hunt during the night. Okay. Um, and, and when they're hunting the exact same uh, prey. If they reduce competition by using different habitats, they are exhibiting spatial resource partitioning. So maybe different parts of the tree. Or if they exhibit evolution of differences in body size or shape, that's morphological resource partitioning. Um, this you'll, you'll do a lab that is similar to this as well, and it's based on um, Darwin's finches. When he was in the Galapagos Islands, he had noticed that there were 14 different finches that had 14 very different beaks, which allowed them to do uh, to take advantage of different resources. This is an example of spatial resource partitioning where these five different uh, species of birds all take different sections of the tree so that they can all share the resource of the tree but again different sections. Predation is the use of one species as a resource by another species. True predators will kill their prey Herbivores will eat plants, but they don't kill it, so obviously they'll grow back. Parasites live on or in the organism they consume, but they rarely kill the host. Um, a single parasite uh, rarely causes the death. Um, parasites that cause disease are called pathogens. Pathogens are like viruses, bacteria, fungi, protists, or worms. Then you have parasitoids, which are organisms that lay eggs inside the other organism, and as the offspring starts to grow, it eventually consumes the host from the inside out. So uh, wasps sometimes do that. Certain types of, um, I think it's flies that do that. Pretty gross. Some prey will escape their predators or have some outer protection, um, like shells for turtles. Um, some are camouflaged, some use chemicals to repel predators. Now these next several slides are not from your textbook, they were just examples that I had had um, in my prior class. Animals can be predators or prey at different life stages. So here you see when an alligator is a baby, it's going to be prey. And once it reaches adulthood, it becomes the predator. So if you saw a paramecium, excuse me, that's an amoeba. That would be a prey. A Venus flytrap, a predator. A crocodile again. In this case, in this life stage, would be a predator. And a grasshopper could be predator or prey. So how has predation influenced evolution? So organisms have developed adaptations to avoid being eaten. So um, plants like cactus or cacti or porcupines those spiny, what are those, blowfish, um, have spines to deter predators. Hard shells such as clams and turtles. Um, toxins. The milkweed plant, when eaten, is toxic to many predators and will kill them. So over time, uh, organisms have decided not to eat the milkweed plant. So then it's able to survive and reproduce. Poison dart frogs also have a toxin in their skin. Um, so organisms don't want to eat them, so they survive and reproduce. Bad taste. Monarchs have a nasty taste that they get from um, what their diet is, which I believe is milkweeds. It doesn't hurt them, and so because they taste bad, organisms don't want to eat them. You can also have camouflage, you can have mimicry, and aposematic colors, which I'll talk about in a second. Predators have also adapted. Bats use echolocation, so they use sound to help guide them. Um, owls have large eyes to allow more light so they can see and hunt in the dark. Um, on this plant, I'm not 
sure what the name of it is, but a fly or other insect will land on the sticky bulbs and then the plant will digest it, much like a Venus flytrap. Um, and then you have jellyfish, which have stingers that will paralyze the prey. So prey has adapted by being able to blend into their surrounding environment. So here I think that was a quail that was blending into the background right there. Um, and you have a deer who blends in with the trees. Mimicry is the ability of an organism to mimic another animal species or plant in color or form or behavior so that organisms will not want to eat them. So here are some examples of camouflage. I love this one because it looks like an owl, this moth. The frog was hidden in the water somewhere. A walking stick. A praying mantis looks like a leaf. A walking leaf right there, I love that one. And another praying mantis. And another mantis which looks like a flower. Aposematic colors um, are, or, or an adaptation that some organisms have evolved to have that basically mimics another animal. So predators had learned that the monarch tasted bad because of their diet and the viceroy ended up evolving to look like the monarch so predators would avoid eating him although he's not toxic himself. Same thing with the king snake. It looks very similar to a coral snake which is dangerous but the pattern of colors is different. Poison dart frogs, again, they have um, toxic skin and are distasteful to predators, so predators stay away from them. So a lot of times an organisms with bright colors are dangerous to predators, and predators actually stay away from animals with bright colors. Okay, so mutualism is interspecific interactions where both species are going to benefit. So in this case, the acacia tree has these nice um, thorns on their body or stems um, that allow the, the ants to go and carve them out and then lay their eggs. And in turn, they protect the tree. So if anything lands on the tree, they go and attack it. Or if vines from a nearby tree start putting too much shade on the acacia tree, the ants will go and destroy that vine. So mutualism, both species benefit. Commensalism is when one species will benefit, but the other is neither harmed nor helped. So fish using corals to hide, or lichens on a tree. Um, this chart is just showing you that a negative is it's negatively affected, a, po a plus sign is that it's positively affected, and a zero means it's not affected at all. So in competition, um, both sides can be neg negatively affected. In predation, obviously the predator is going to be positively affected because he's getting to eat, and species two is negatively affected because he's the one being eaten. In mutualism, both are benefiting, and in commensalism, one species is positively affected, and the other one is not affected at all. A keystone species is one that plays an important role in the community that's far more important than its relative abundance might suggest, meaning that there may not be high numbers of this particular species, but the survival of the ecosystem or community is important because of their presence. So in this example, you have beavers um, that will build dams that ends up creating new aquatic habitats for organisms and it also has watering holes for other mobile organisms. Another example are sea otters. Sea otters will eat um, mussels and so and kelp so that those aren't runaway uh, population growth problems. Um, so sea otters are really important to aquatic ecosystems. Then we get into primary succession. Even without human activity, natural communities are not going to stay the same forever, and sometimes events will happen um, to change the community, and that is succession, which is the replacement of one group of species by another uh, group over time. So the first one, primary succession, is 
when it's basically a brand new ecosystem that there was not soil to begin with. So if there was an abandoned parking lot or there was some newly exposed rock after a glacier uh, melted and retreated over the area and so just left the rock or if it was um, newly cooled lava from a volcano. So at first there's no soil. So you have bare rock and then organisms like algae or lichen or mosses will start to grow on the rocks because they can survive with little or no soil. Um, they will they have acids that they excrete and that allows them to take up nutrients directly from the rock which is so weird. And um, this chemical alteration of the rock also makes it more susceptible to erosion so then when you have the organic matter from the lichens and mosses when they die and it mixes with the minerals eroded from the rock you start to create soil and this takes time it could take hundreds to thousands of years just to make an inch of soil um, so once you start having soil develop then you have plants that are able to start growing like grasses or wild fire uh, fires wild flowers um, then you start to have the bigger weeds and grasses and then you have shrubs and depending on the area and what types of seeds end up coming into the ecosystem you will get bigger and bigger trees um, a really good example of primary succession is when the volcano Krakatau had erupted in 1883 and had covered the entire island with lava and ash <clears throat> excuse me and within a year algae and grasses had already become established on top of that rock and ash and then a few only a few years later came trees and shrubs and so they were able to observe this succession of newly cooled lava and a forest growing on it secondary succession occurs in areas that have been disturbed but have not lost their soil so most cases it's a natural disaster like a forest fire a hurricane flooding that will remove vegetation but not the soil so it's one that has been disturbed but did not want lose their soil so they again start with weeds and grasses and then go to shrubs and then trees there's also succession for aquatic areas and this um, image shows you the pattern of succession in freshwater lakes so originally which is the top picture a, gla a glacier can carve out a lake um, taking with it all of its sediments and vegetation and you know water f flows into it or rains into it and over time you have algae and aquatic plants that will colonize that lake so with that plants with those plants and the algae and then the erosion of the rock above it the basin will start to fill slowly fill with that sediment and organic matter so as it accumulates the water levels uh, be, make the lake very shallow and it can take it could take thousands of years for that to happen but over time sediments will fill up that lake and then uh, it could become a terrestrial ecosystem species diversity these two terms are not in this chapter and I think they're in chapter 5 but what species diversity is is species species richness plus species evenness richness is the number of different species there are and evenness is how many individuals there are within each of those species so make sure you know those terms richness and evenness um, there are four major factors that determine species richness and that's latitude time habitat size and distance the number of species will decline as we move from the equators to the poles which kind of makes sense because we know the most diverse terrestrial biome is the rainforest which happens around the equator and the most uh, diverse aquatic ecosystem is the coral reef which also is in warm areas and as you go from the equator to the poles you have fewer organisms the longer a habitat exists the more colonization so then the more reproduction 
the more speciation and extinction occurs. Habitat size, uh, larger habitats will generally have more species because there are more resources available and there is uh, more opportunity for growth, uh, reproduction, um, and natural selection take place. So they're going to have more species. And then distance, when you have islands that are closer to continents, those will typically have more species than islands farther away. And that is because species can fly or potentially swim to islands that are close to the mainland. So then you can have more speciation there. But if the island is further away and not as many species can fly there or swim there, well, obviously they're going to be limited in species. And that's basically what this graph is showing, which is the theory of island biogeography that just says that habitat size um, and how far away it is is going to determine how many different species there are or the species richness. So you can see there as um, the island gets bigger, then the number of species will go up. Okay, that is the end of chapter six. This was a longer chapter, I believe about 27 pages and a lot of vocabulary terms. So please make sure that you have read the chapter as this video lecture did not go over everything that you need to read. All right, thanks.